in MLS 2611, licensed by the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation under the California Residential Mortgage Lending Act, subject to credit approval. Call 823-852-6464 for terms and conditions. You can crush it, too, with a 30-year fixed 2.625% rate in APR with absolutely no closing costs. Find the employees you need to get your business moving. Sign up with iHeartAdBuilder.com and create a custom radio ad to reach job features listening to stations just like this one. Get started today at iHeartAdBuilder.com. Rates subject to change without notice. Minimum loan amount and certain restrictions apply. 50% loan to value and 740 FICO credit score. First lien only. This is a dramatization. Cash out will vary. Subject to credit approval. NMLS 3290. Loans made or arranged pursuant to a California financing law license. Number 6036970. Equal housing lender. Can you believe how much the Garcias have sold for? I know. Home values are so, so high, high right now. I wish I could pull about $50,000 from my home's equity without selling. You can. We just pulled cash from our home's equity to redo our backyard this summer. We used IntelliLoan. And get this, our monthly payments actually went down. IntelliLoan offered us a 1.875% rate and APR with no points or lender fees. Wow. 1.875% with no points? And no lender fees. Hello, new pool. Take the number. It's 800-918-6200. 800-918-6200. Or just go to IntelliLoan.com. IntelliLoan. Borrow smart. Hey, it's John and Ken from KFI AM640. The summer sun's about to set, Hey, it's time to go back to school. Whether you're headed to the classroom or walking the kids to the bus, you can bring the free iHeart app with you everywhere you go. So this year, bring KFI AM640 as your study partner. Share the songs you love with your closest friends, get expert knowledge on any subject from thousands of podcasts, and get serious about your studying with playlists. It's all free and waiting for you on the iHeart app, number one for music, radio, and podcasts, all in one app. The perfect paint is waiting for you at your local Benjamin Moore retailer. Find yours at BenjaminMoore.com. Good morning, everyone. This is KFI AM640, more stimulating talk. Don't forget that you can catch KFI everywhere and anytime on the iHeartRadio app. My name is Oscar Ramirez, and I'm the host of The Daily Dive, a daily news podcast covering some of the top stories making waves in the news. You can catch a new episode of The Daily Dive Monday through Friday on iHeartRadio, and it's ready for you when you wake up. Here on The Daily Dive Weekend Edition, I'll be bringing you some of the best stories I covered during the week. This week, we saw the last evacuation plans and troops leave Afghanistan, ending the longest war America has been involved in. There are still some Americans and Afghans that remain there, but their evacuation will no longer be a Pentagon mission. It will now be a diplomatic mission. In the end, after 20 years, the U.S. failed to defeat the Taliban, establish a functioning democracy, and stop ISIS extremists. What happens next is still unclear as we need to resettle thousands of Afghans and see what kind of government is formed by the Taliban. For more on the end of America's presence in Afghanistan, we'll speak to Isham Tharoor, foreign affairs columnist at the Washington Post. Well, yes, it's, it's come amid these really harrowing scenes we've seen over the past couple of weeks um, with you know, countless Afghan civilians and others trying to get to Kabul airport, which the United States and some of its allies had control over now. Uh, we've seen, we're seeing as we speak, uh, footage of, of Taliban fighters walking through the hangars of this airport, uh, commandeering some of the U.S. vehicles that have been left there. Uh, it's all highly symbolic. It's all, uh, incredibly sad if you're somebody who was invested in this 20 year effort to stabilize Afghanistan, roll back Taliban, and, uh, set up some kind of functional democratic fledgling republic there uh, of course it, this, there, there's no actual end to this conflict uh, the US will remain engaged in various other ways uh, including uh, we imagine um, various sorts of clandestine counterterrorism operations against this Islamic State outfit that's already uh, operating in Afghanistan and carried out that deadly attack last week so it, it, it's a symbolic end but it of course, there's a lot that's still going to keep on going. Definitely. Especially, as I mentioned, you know, if the State Department is still going to be working to try to get the last remaining few people out of there. There's going to be some type of presence there eventually. And you mentioned, you know, the Taliban walking through trying to commandeer whatever's left there. You know, the General McKenzie, he did say that they either destroyed or decommissioned whatever that they had left there, you know, in the hopes that 
they wouldn't be able to reuse any of that. But Sean, tell me a little bit more about the failures basically that happened there because 20 years ago we did go in there to Afghanistan, took down the Taliban government, but in the end they're back. We failed to defeat them and as you were talking about the rise of ISIS-K, all this other stuff, we didn't really do the job that we set out to do on that front of it. Yeah, and I think there's there's a there's this kind of fascinating thing happening in the United States right now when we talk about what's happening in Afghanistan, uh, especially here in Washington where I'm sitting, uh, where uh, a whole bunch of very prominent people who have a long history uh, in, in, in so far as managing these conflicts are criticizing this administration for its uh, for its decision to withdraw. It's criticizing this administration for for not being flexible enough to remain and, and maintain this military footprint, while at the same time there's less of a conversation uh, about all the years uh, in, the, in the past that have led, led us to this moment, all the many mistakes. And so what am I talking about? I'm talking about um, a military occupation in, uh, run by the United States that saw quite a few uh, Afghan civil civilian casualties and airstrikes and other sorts of actions. I'm not talking about uh, a culture of uh, aid, especially um, you know, massive amounts of money that the U.S. pumped into Afghanistan that not only was siphoned off by various corrupt officials, but almost to some extent that we see this in uh, a, a whole host of uh, classified documents that my colleagues have reported on, uh, that in and of itself created a culture of corruption and fecklessness within the Afghan state. There was just so much money sloshing around that people did not know what to do with. So there's a failed state building project. And of course, what we've seen in the last few months is this complete collapse of an Afghan military that the United States invested so much time and energy in training and equipping. Uh, and, and that raises a lot of questions, uh, not just about you know, the nature of American confidence in what they were doing, but also uh, understanding of the situation and what makes uh, Afghan society and Afghan government click and work. And, and what we saw was a lot of uh, deals, a lot of, uh, kind of quiet deals that happened between local Afghan forces and Taliban, uh, a widespread lack of uh, uh, morale, a widespread lack of trust in the central government, the United States of trust that had propped up for so long, but also that was compounded by American mistakes. And there we're dealing with uh, Kabul and also this whole process of negotiations with Taliban that many argue have a way too late. And so what happens now going forward? Obviously, the credibility of the U.S. is damaged there, especially in that region, but with some of our allies as well. And then what happens with the Taliban now? They have to set up a government. Who knows how they'll operate with other countries? You know, these are all the next steps to look out for. I would caution against talking so broadly about American credibility being damaged. I think uh, there are a lot of people in Afghanistan who wanted the Americans to go. Uh, there are a lot of people there who, uh, even if they don't like the Taliban, were not particularly pleased by the way in which uh, you know they were function operating in the country. Uh, controlled by uh, a government that's popped up by the U.S. that is feckless and quite weak in many ways. So, and then, I think more broadly speaking, going forward, yes, we will see uh, the U.S. remain engaged to a certain extent in trying to help broker whatever the, the post-Taliban uh, takeover political situation looks like. There are talks happening between Taliban officials and other Afghan figures who are still in Kabul over some kind of uh, interim government at least. Uh, obviously, the Taliban will have a much bigger role and much bigger seat at the table than the Americans would like, but that can't necessarily be helped at this point. I think, I think more broadly, and what Americans kind of have to sit with to a certain extent, is that the legacy of these 20 years is one that really calls into question some of the the delusions and belief in American power on the world stage. The U.S. did a hell of a lot in trying to develop uh, think, uh, infrastructure in Afghanistan, trying to build democracy there, and trying to fight this war. And it, it invested a lot of blood, it, it a, lot of, a lot of treasure, it lost a lot of lives, it, it participated in a conflict that led to a lot of deaths for Afghan civilians. And yet, what did it have to show for it? On the way out, 
American officials were burning American flags in the U.S. embassy to make sure that these American flags didn't fall into the Taliban hands. And that seems to be quite, quite a bleak metaphor for 20 years of uh, investment in that country. Uh, so it, it, the Biden administration, though, is making a different bet. They're, 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 they believe that uh, it's time to get out, and they've already stuck to the deadline, which was today. Uh, and they've pulled out, and they believe that the U.S.'s influence on the world stage is not defined by uh, these kind of counterinsurgency operations in far, far, far parts of the world, but rather a more kind of robust uh, challenge to China, perhaps, also a greater emphasis on rebuilding, on nation building at home. And so, so the dynamic uh, there will remain, uh, will be one that's going to be contested a lot in Washington in days to come. You know, finally, obviously, the political toll on the administration with all of this, right? I mean, there's going to be investigations into why we didn't pull out faster. I mean, not pull out faster, but uh, start evacuating Americans and Afghans earlier. That's also one of the next steps, too, the political damage that the administration is going to suffer because of all this. That's definitely there. I think uh, you're going to have a lot of uh, Benghazi redux, perhaps, from Republicans uh, in, co in Congress. Uh, I think they're banking on the fact that polls show, at least have shown up so late, that most Americans support ending the war uh, in Afghanistan, uh, and that most Americans uh, uh, support, uh, you know, drawing down uh, the American military footprint overseas in general. Uh, I think what's going to happen now is a rather ugly set of factors. Well, it's important to remember that. The situation in Afghanistan is really fragile, and there's a, a looming humanitarian crisis, a looming economic crisis in the country, uh, and you're going to see various flows of refugees continuing, even though the U.S. isn't evacuating anyone anymore. And so the focus in, in some places already or has already turned to this, but there will be a pretty nasty partisan fight over refugees, probably, and there will be a pretty nasty partisan fight over you know, what the legacy of this whole war is. And, and, and the tragedy of that is that it shouldn't be partisan. Both Democrats and Republicans should own it because they both participated in this kind of Ishan Azor, Foreign Affairs columnist at the Washington Post. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. You're listening to the Daily Dive Weekend Edition on KFI AM 640 and everywhere in the iHeartRadio app. When we come back, we'll tell you about how some companies are working to replicate our sense of smell with a digital note of the future. When Bill and I needed new windows over 20 years ago, we picked a company we thought would do a good job. We were so disappointed. So we saw a genuine need for a company with strong character, one that people could have faith in. American Vision Windows was born right then and there. What sets American Vision Windows apart is easily the culture. Their greatest investment is in their employees, and it shows. With a great experience, I couldn't have asked for anything better. I've been in the construction trade for 35 years. The level of quality of products that they use for their prep work was top notch. American Vision Windows can continues to revolutionize the home improvement industry one customer at a time while changing the lives of our employees for the better. It's so simple. Happy employee, happy customer. For a limited time, American Vision Windows will pay the tax. Plus, you won't need to make payments for six whole months. Call 888-226-9908. That's 888-226-9908. Or visit AmericanVisionWindows.com. Our approved credit is not all applicants will qualify. The restrictions apply. Call us your website for details. Offer ends 1031-2021. CSLV number 778-326. My part-time service in the Army National Guard makes it possible for me to be more for the community I call home. I'm a better neighbor because my service has taught me how important it is to be a team player. My training helps me in my classes when I give attention to detail to the task at hand. My service in the Army National Guard allows me to keep my country safe from threat. Learn more about how you too can live and serve part-time by visiting NationalGuard.com. Sponsored by the California Army National Guard. Aired by the California Broadcasters Association and this station. We've got you covered, America. Go solar American style with Semper Solaris, and we'll cover your electric bill. Semper Solaris is your local veteran-owned solar and battery storage contractor. Add Tesla Powerwall and be ready for blackouts. We get the job done with a spree decor and honor. 
The First Solaris offers new AC systems with a lifetime warranty and new roofs with a 50-year warranty. We hire vets and give back to the community with our Semper Cares initiative. Go solar yes, American style with Semper Solaris and we'll cover your electric bill. Zero down, zero interest, and zero payments until 2023. Get the federal 26% solar and battery tax credit. $500 off for military, first responders, and health care workers. Call 877-211-5591. That's 877-211-5591. Or visit SemperSolaris.com. With minimum purchase of 10 panels, up to $500 paid for an electric bill. Cannot be combined with any other offers. Some restrictions apply. Call or see website for details. Expires 930 2021. CSLB number 978152. <laughs> Also accepting real estate donations. Yes, I know. I have a calming demeanor. You know when it's your job basically to push people beyond their comfort zones, it's good to make them feel as safe as possible. Like an open heart surgeon for your home. You'll do fine. No worries. We got it. Home with Dean Sharp. The House Whisperer. This morning at 9 on KFI AM 640. More stimulating talk. This is KFI AM 640. I'm Oscar Ramirez, and you're listening to the Daily Dog Weekend Edition. On the science and technology front, we're seeing a new generation of companies make big strides in the science of smell. And a device that looks like a big purple nipple could be the digital nose of the future. This device will be used by Anheuser-Busch to measure how beverages, aromatic notes are perceived and try to enhance flavors. And it will also be used with a different company to detect traces of marijuana on people suspected of driving under the influence. For more on this device, trying to replicate our sense of smell, we'll speak to Zach Schongrun, contributor at Bloomberg One of the challenges, the stickiest challenges in technology is Designing a sensor that can, you know, effectively replicate the versatility and, uh, you know, robustness and stability of well, the human nose. You know, we have sensors, as you said, that can recognize our faces and, you know, feel our touch or, you know, recognize our voices. But smell has been, it's been a challenge. And, um, you know, it's, it's not been something that, uh, you know, there's a lot of energy around this this pursuit um, of building an electronic nose or a smell sensor in the 90s. A bunch of companies got a lot of attention uh, for their more chemical-based uh, detectors that um, were, were, you know, were somewhat effective, but um, you know, certainly had limitations uh, and, and in you know what they could be used for um, with uh, with smell detection. And so they kind of just faded away. And um, but you know, but lately there is uh, there's been a lot of new energy. Technology has, has obviously advanced. Some of the biotechnology um, in particular has advanced in incorporating more biological processes and biologically based systems into electronics and technology has kind of enabled a handful of, of new companies to emerge and, and they feel like they've kind of cracked it. So my, my story, uh, I tried to apply a, a good amount of skepticism into it because knowing, you know, how much of a challenge it has been, but there's reason to think that a few of these companies have gotten further along than others in the past. Let's talk about the first one, the giant purple nipple, just because it's an interesting <laughs> device uh, it's made by a company called Conicu. The device itself is called Conicor, and it's a, a like a purple bubble thing. But uh, it has. It's. I think they're going to be putting it up in some airports pretty soon. It's interesting. It, it uh, even has some living nerve cells inside of the device to help with sensing smell. So tell us about that device and then the practicality of it. Right. I, I mean, I'm sorry. They have a. They have a deal with Anheuser Busch. So uh, t- uh, tell us the practicality of it. What are they going to be using it for? So Conico is, is kind of the furthest furthest along in this. Um, you know, what they have done is they figured out a way to actually use uh, living nerve cells, uh, the neurons that uh, we would that we have in uh, oh way high up in our in our nasal cavity. Uh, that act as the receptors, you know, uh, when we sniff something or an odor passes across our faces and up our nose, um, you know, those receptors are, are what transmit that information to our brain. And so Conico has really hijacked that, that system, they, and they've been able to do it using, you know, real human 
uh, nerve cells uh, that are programmed to um, pick up on on odors just as just as our nose would. And, but instead of uh, transmitting that information to a brain, you know, they figured out a way to transmit it to a chip uh, or a you know a computer and recognize odors that way. And so that's kind of the basis uh, around you know what they've done. It, it's it's uh, it, you know the the I suppose the closest to replicating you know how biology works for for us and, and other mammals and uh, in the nose. Um, you know there are limitations uh, to to what they can do with it as well. But um, you know they feel like their um, their device is is portable. Um, you know it it uh, it's, it's not overly huge, uh, you know, it can hang on a wall, and as you mentioned, it's going, they have a partnership with Airbus that's going to have these things start to appear in, uh, in airport terminals that are programmed to pick up on explosives, uh, and they've done, uh, you know, traces of explosives. They did testing last year uh, with the FBI and the uh, police unit actually in Mobile, Alabama, where they found that the devices were more accurate in picking up on the traces of explosives than um, trained bomb-sniffing dogs. So they're starting to uh, roll out these devices in, in airport terminals, and so that's one application that they're working on. The other, as you mentioned, is uh, in the food and beverage space with uh, with Anheuser Busch, um, testing you know various products, trying to understand uh, you know how flavor notes and uh, odors from uh, you know various beverage beverages, kind of how how our odors, how our noses respond to different notes and, and hints of odors in, in different beverages. So that's kind of interesting. In the, in the food and beverage space. And then they're also working with uh, Thermo Fisher, um, the, uh, the sensor giant, on building a device that can pick up on traces of marijuana. Uh, and so the idea is to have uh, the Conicor um, start to get filtered out into police stations and police vehicles so that they can do more accurate roadside testing of um, you know, people suspected of, uh, of driving while under the influence of, of marijuana. So kind of three very different pursuits, and I think right. that speaks to just the versatility of, of the device and what they've been able to achieve. You laid those out very well, you know, improving pace, uh, picking up on all those different things, but even helping to detect illness has been a thing that uh, scientists have been working with smell for a long time. They know that they can pick up, you know, if people have certain diseases or illnesses based off of the way they smell through their sweat, through their breath, all that stuff. So these devices... And these companies that are working on this stuff also are looking into that, especially with coronavirus right now going on. There was all sorts of stories about dogs being able to sniff things out like that. We generally just don't give enough credit to what our noses are are capable of. We don't, you know, we we don't pay enough attention, and uh, we don't really have much need to pay attention to what our noses can do. But you know, people who are trained uh, to use their noses. Think of sommeliers and you know flavorists and, and things like that. They they can be pretty remarkable about what they can do with their noses. And there's evidence that you know certain diseases give off uh, you know have odorous qualities as well. Um, you know what what's actually going on here is the you know the, the biological breakdown of you know when a disease affects cells, it gives off uh, what are called VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Um, that's what the dogs are, are picking up on. They get, you know, as you mentioned, it's kind of ejected from our body in sweat and in breath. Um, so figuring out a device that can pick up on these VOCs the way that a dog's nose can is, uh, is yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly of, of interest. And definitely there's more interest and urgency, as you mentioned, now because we're, we're much more aware and, and conscious and worried about what's in the air around us, um, you know, as we're living through this global pandemic. That's a direction that another company, Aromix, which is another company that I focused on in the piece, that, that's the direction that they are primarily heading, more in that diagnostic direction. Uh, you know, again, they, there are opportunities there. There are also challenges and limitations. Their system is not built around the entire nerve cell, the entire, you know, olfactory system that Conico uh, has been using. They focus on They've been able to uh, achieve a way to use use the odor receptors, the, the proteins uh, that uh, bind to odors inside our nose. Um, it's not quite as developed as the, the Conico system, but they feel like it works essentially the same way. It's able to recognize odors, you know, send that signal to uh, to a, again a chip reader uh, and a computer, and give that recognition of of whatever it's trying to. 
whatever it's trying to smell. You know, the challenge there with their system is that right now they're laboratory based. So they have partnered with companies, but those companies have to send in their samples to be tested, you know, into the laboratory. And so getting out of the laboratory for them, building a device that's more portable, that can sit in a doctor's office, or, you know, in their case, they would like to build something that's more like a pregnancy test or a glucose test that's a single use biological strip or sample uh, that uh, can be kind of opened up and unsealed, recognize, you know, what VOCs it detects in the breath or in the sweat, uh, you know, give off that signal uh, and then be discarded. So that's kind of the direction that, that they're heading with their with their company, but, um, but it's interesting. Zach, Sean Byrne, contributor to Bloomberg Business Week. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. You're listening to the Daily Dive Weekend Edition on KFI AM640 and everywhere in the iHeartRadio app. I'll be back with some more top stories from the week, but first, let's get an update from the KFI Newsroom. KFI News on the hour, on the half, and when it breaks. I'm Brian Bruin from the KFI 24-Hour Newsroom. The kids of a woman who was run over and killed by L.A. County Sheriff's deputies in 2020 are suing L.A. County. Karen Land was crossing Imperial Highway at Slater Street in a wheelchair in a crosswalk last December when she collapsed and fell. Several drivers swerved or stopped to avoid her, but an L.A. County Sheriff's Patrol car hit her. Some areas outside of New Orleans hit by Hurricane Ida might stay in the dark till the end of the month. Philip May with Entergy Louisiana says power might not be restored to as many as five parishes in southeastern Louisiana until September 29th. He says for some customers, the wait time could be even longer. He added that Hurricane Ida has knocked down more power poles than Hurricanes Katrina, Zeta, and Delta combined. Plot it, Stefani, in KFI News. SoCal weather from KFI brought to you by Wendy's Breakfast. Highs in the mid-70s to near 80 at the beaches, upper 80s to upper 90s in metro LA and OC, mid-90s to mid-100s in the inland valleys, and highs in the low to mid-100s in the inland empire. We lead local from the KFI 24-hour newsroom. I'm Brian Bruman. Picking KFI traffic, we do have a crash in the Chino area, 60 westbound at Central Avenue, that's blocking the center lane. To South El Monte on the 60 westbound at Santa Anita, right here has the three left lane block, traffic is slow as you approach. And to Hawthorne on the 405 southbound at El Segundo Boulevard, look out for a wreck there on the right shoulder. KFI in the sky helps get you there faster. I'm Jonathan White. What's the deal? Dollar ninety nine breakfast croissants. Right now at Wendy's, you can get a sausage or bacon egg and Swiss croissant for just one ninety nine. Fresh cracked eggs, oven baked bacon, grilled sausage, all on a hot and buttery flaky croissant. Choose wisely. Choose Wendy's. Limited time only. Price and participation may vary. Rates subject to change without notice. Minimum loan amount requirements apply. Fifty percent loan to value and seven forty FICO credit score. Certain restrictions apply. Subject to credit approval. NMLS three two nine zero. Loans made or arranged pursuant to a California Finance Lenders Law License Number six zero three six nine seven zero. Equal housing lender. Unbelievable. Home loan rates have dropped again at Intel Alone. Today, Intel Alone is offering a 1.875% rate in the APR with no points and no lender fees. Did you hear that? A 1.875%. Don't think you qualify? I bet you haven't called Intel Alone. You don't have to have perfect credit to get this great home loan. So lock in this unbelievably low 1.875% fixed rate in APR with no points and no lender fees. So call and tell a loan before the rates go up. Call them at 1-800-918-6200. That's 1-800-918-6200. Or just go to IntelliLoan.com. IntelliLoan. Borrow smart. Hitting speed bumps in your hiring process? Streamline your route to Hired with Indeed. Their hiring platform makes it easy to attract, screen, and interview candidates. All in the same place. Find your next great hire and visit Indeed.com slash credit. So the car market come down. You need to sell your car before the end of August if you want to sell it. But it's crazy high money. Give me the VIN.com. America's best car buyer. Sell us your car. Give me the VIN.com. So easy you can do it and you're out of the Income eligible renters impacted by COVID-19 can now get 100% of their past due rent and utility bills paid through the California COVID-19 Rent Relief Program. 
Landlords with tenants who haven't paid rent because of COVID-19 are eligible for 100% reimbursement too. The application is fast, your information is private, and you won't be asked about citizenship. Apply at housingiskey.com before eviction protections end on September 30th. Brought to you by the California Department of Housing and Community Development. KFI AM 640. Live. KFI AM 640. Local. And our radio station. This is KFI AM 640, heard everywhere in the iHeartRadio app. I'm Oscar Ramirez, and you're listening to the Daily Dive Weekend Edition. The next big phase of our withdrawal from Afghanistan will be the resettlement of thousands of Afghans in the communities across the country. Refugee organizations that deal with the State Department are ramping up their operations and have been told to expect some that have special immigrant visas and as many as 50,000 Afghans without visas. For more on what's next for these Afghan refugees, we'll speak to Michelle Hackman, reporter at the Wall Street Journal. We have evacuated tons of Afghans. Many of them are in the final stages of qualifying for what's called a special immigrant visa. That's designed for Afghans to work alongside the American military, uh, you know, work with the American embassy. But a lot of people are coming to be evacuated, especially in the early days, who don't necessarily fit a visa category, but we definitely were extremely vulnerable if we left them in, in Afghanistan. So, you know, I'm talking about women's rights leaders, human, right, human rights activists, people like that, who, some of whom we've, we've had third countries agree to take them on, but many of whom will be brought to the United States. And those people are going to need help when they get here. You know, we can't just sort of dump them on the street to fend for themselves, and that's where these organizations come in. Let's focus uh, for a moment, please, if we can, uh, on the visas, because you get the special yeah. immigrant visa, and that allows you uh, to get help, social services, as I mentioned, different things like that. But for those that don't have those visas, they're not eligible for that. So uh, uh, the help that comes to them is going to come through private donations and other means. That's exactly right. So, you know, those special immigrant visa holders that I was just talking about, they are treated um, the same way as other refugees coming into the country sort of formally through the refugee program. We help those people, you know, find apartments to live in, enroll their kids in school. We give them a certain amount of health care assistance for a couple months, you know, food assistance for a couple months. It's, it's you know, not a huge amount of help. We have this sort of tough love approach to refugees where we say, we're going to try to set you up with a job, but after that, you're kind of on your own. But we can't even do that for a lot of the people that we're bringing in uh, who don't have visas because we just, you know, the government hasn't allotted money to sort of provide those services to them. But the Biden administration wants them to receive many of those services. And so it's sort of asking these, these refugee resettlement organizations to step up and make it work somehow. And, and, and these uh, programs all also don't result in any permanent immigration status. Is that for both of them, or, or how, how is that part going to work out? So visa holders, if you have a visa and you come to the United States, that results in a green card. If you come as a refugee or a special immigrant visa applicant. But if you don't, if you come to the U.S. otherwise, um, you are coming in on something called humanitarian parole. Now, that's not even a visa. It's just sort of a form of temporary permission to be here. It does not result in any kind of permanent immigration status. So, you know, that's an issue. All these people are going to have to be connected with immigration lawyers to apply for asylum or apply for some other kind of visa. Uh, once they're here, else they'll fall out of status. But more immediately, it also means, yeah, exactly, that they, you know, because they're not a, a sort of form, formal visa holder, that they're not going to get any kind of government assistance. And so, um, these organizations are sort of scraping together private donations to, to make it work for them. Uh, back to those organizations, uh, there was a lot of cutbacks that they've had in the past few years. So, uh, like I said, they're in that ramp-up stage getting volunteers and, and other staffing so that they can help with the influx. Um, and, and on this other side of things, the, the, the good part is that they've been seeing a lot of uh, people, a lot of uh, Americans stepping up saying that they want to help volunteer, time, space, everything that they can possibly do. Right. It's a two-sided story. So, you know, there, there are nine formal refugee resettlement organizations that have contracts with the federal government. There are obviously many more um, that do work alongside these organizations. But the ones that, you know, they're, they're names that you'd be familiar with, the International Rescue Committee, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, the Lutheran Church uh, does this work, the Catholic Church does this work. Um, they get paid by the government 
according to directly according to how many refugees they resettle. And under, you know, President Trump, there were fewer and fewer refugees to resettle. And so all of these organizations had to cut down staff, had to close offices. And so they came into this this current crisis sort of with fewer means than they would have had um, pre previous to now. Um, the flip side of that is that, you know, they're, they're short staff, but they're getting flooded with donations, with requests to volunteer, with offers even, you know, I've, I've heard from a lot of people that uh, ordinary Americans, a lot of veterans are stepping forward and saying, you know, I have a, I have an empty apartment that I own or I have a spare room in my house and I'd like a refugee to be able to stay here for a few weeks or whatever. And we're seeing major U.S. companies step up as well. We already heard about Airbnb saying that they're going to house up to 20,000 Afghan refugees possibly and uh, Walmart is also trying to step up with some programs as well. Right, exactly. And I think we'll, we'll see more of that as time goes on. You know, it's a, it's a pretty politi politically popular cause to support these Afghan refugees. I'd say probably more bipartisan than most other immigration issues. And so it, it's an easy one for, you know, uh, corporate America to get involved in. And on that front, you know, the political side of things, I mean, really anything that needs to be changed with regards to the visas or, um, you know, even uh, allowing some of these uh, Afghans that don't have that special immigrant visa, I mean, any of those changes are going to have to be run through Congress, right? That's right. So there's a big urgent push. The most urgent push is to try to change the law for um, these people who receive humanitarian parole. And the U.S. is estimating it might grant parole up to 50,000 people to try to get Congress to give those people the same services afforded to other refugees. And then eventually, you know, it's, it's very early in the conversations, but there are obviously some people advocating um, that these people be given some kind of path to citizenship because right now there is no direct path. Michelle Hackman, reporter covering immigration at the Wall Street Journal. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. On the COVID front, the demand for deworming drug ivermectin has been surging to more than 80,000 prescriptions per week. Pharmacists have been reporting shortages of the drug, which is used in small doses in humans to treat lice, scabies, and other parasites, but most commonly used in animals. For more on the surging demand, despite studies showing that it does little to treat COVID, we'll speak to Emma Goldberg, reporter at the New York Times. We are seeing a trend across the country in which prescriptions for ivermectin are sharply on the rise. Earlier in August, they jumped to a number of more than 88,000 prescriptions per week. And that's up from a pre-pandemic baseline average of 3,600 per week. So that's a huge rise in people who are being prescribed ivermectin. And the important thing to know here is that it has repeatedly failed in clinical trials to help people infected with coronavirus. So there hasn't been quality evidence confirming yet that either it works either to treat or prevent COVID. How did this get started? You know, where did the popularity of it come from? That so much so that patients are acting, asking for it, and, and even the doctors. Some doctors are actually prescribing it. Out. It's one of those things that is quickly spreading on social media, in a lot of Facebook groups and on Reddit. There's been a lot of attention to ivermectin. What physicians and researchers are first concerned about right now is people actually taking the veterinary formulation, which is often a dosage far higher than are appropriate for human consumption. And some people are saying they are overdosing, they are crawling, poison control centers are putting all kinds of problems in nausea, diarrhea a lot of other issues. So the real risk here in particular is around people taking this veterinary formulation. But then again, even the, the human formulation has not been approved by the FDA to treat COVID. So physicians are saying that people should not be seeking this out to treat and prevent COVID right now. And since there's no indication that it's been approved by the FDA. Okay, and the FDA even said something, uh, or I think the CDC or the FDA was even trying to acknowledge it last week as well. To your point, in Mississippi's health department said that earlier this month, 70% of their calls to their poison control center had come from people who injected ivermectin that they got from livestock supply stores. So people are going out and seeking the animal version of it. That is exactly like people are going out on their own and seeking it, and that is at great risk to their health. I spoke with a toxicologist in South Texas who said that while in 2019, the poison control...